Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today, I'm going to switch things up a little bit. I know that I said that I would cover raw milk today, but I still want to go over some of the things that I covered last week about dairy. It's just an issue that it's very easy to whip off a one-page you know, summary of dairy's good, dairy's bad, and move on. But I come from the perspective that as a physician for... The 16 years in which I was seeing patients five days a week, and that's a lot of patients, that the single most important thing that I did that showed the most effect, the most benefit in the most people was asking people to stop all dairy products for a period of time and hopefully forever. Now, I didn't have anything against the dairy industry, so to say. I wasn't trying to denigrate them. I was simply trying to ameliorate the situation in front of me in that patient's life, whether it was a serious one or a non-serious one, whether it was about ear infections or sinusitis, chronic sinusitis, or uh, children are not responsive to certain things and they were not, you know, critically, uh, they were not diagnosed as uh, on the uh, on the spectrum. Some were just not quite catching on. That dairy had a lot to do with all this. I only knew that helping them through, helping them make the transition, and then actually reintroducing it at a period of not less than six weeks, ideally eight weeks that they had been without, and we're talking zero, dairy, and they would come back and they would feel the ill effects, the return of whatever the symptoms were they had when they first came in to see. So, that's where I'm coming from. So now that I'm not that booked up, so to say, that I get to look into why was that? You know, what was the what were the issues behind that? And they weren't all the same issue for every patient. So I'm going to park that there. This is what we're about to embark on today, and I'm going to elaborate. And I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but that's me trying to be somewhat organized. I do want to go over and do a little what they call housekeeping. You know, I'm getting questions in, so I think it's important for me to say, for those who have questions, feel free to send in your questions to Dr. Goldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. So it's D-R-G-O-L-D-K-A-M-P at keto, K-E-T-O, naturopath, N-A-T-U-R-O-P-A-T-H dot com. Dr. Goldcamp at uh, ketonaturopath.com. Or if you're in the Facebook group, you can post a question there. You can PM me. So you can get me pretty much anywhere. So keep doing that. And the questions that come up to, relevant to the topic that I'm talking about, I will call them together and answer them that way. I just think that's a better way instead of shouting out people's names. you know. And Richard said this, and Judy said this, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, now, other things that I would suggest that that you do, kind of which are just generic to me talking about keto. And my approach to starting keto, and if anybody's in the Facebook group, they'll clearly know ad nauseum that this is what I say. Calculate your macros, track your macros, and track your biomarkers, which are your ketones and your glucose, which means you obviously need a ketometer and a um, glucometer. And when I say uh, create, calculate your macros, you're going to have to do that just once. And then you're going to track your macros for maybe a week or two. You're going to have to learn it. You're going to have to learn how to measure food and so on. But that's only the first couple of weeks of being that technical. When you get that down, you can stop doing that. Come back in six months and do it again just to check in with yourself. So it really ends up being training wheels. Just like when you learn to ride your bike, somebody was there to help you and you did it st- completely straight, and it, it, then you did it again and again, but they were there to support you and put you back up. And then it becomes old hat. You know 
you can recognize food, their quantities, uh, not just the calories and so on, but when you're putting in your macros, you, you've got a sense of it. But you need the training wheels. I totally believe that. I like the empirical part of it. It's measurable. It's not just hearsay. We get comments every so often in the Facebook group of people asking a, a really non-specific question. Oh, I have, uh, I didn't do well on my labs. Okay, can I see your labs? Because of, because of keto was the implication. Never never had any labs. So by being empirical from the beginning, we can go back and say, where are we here? How, 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 how has this reacted with you? And by the way, we are not all robots. We all have a different sensitivity to... Uh, glucose, a different insulin sensitivity. And in each part of our bodies, we have dis- different sensitivities. Insulin receptors are throughout our whole body, from our brain to our muscle to our heart. So, and the each one of those may have a different degree of sensitivity or slash resistance, okay? So there's a lot that we do on a per-person basis. The bigger concept is generic, and we all get that. Drop your carbs. So let's say you're listening to me and you do not want to do any of this technical stuff. And I really suggest you do this, what I just described, calculating your macros, tracking your macros and tracking your biomarkers. But you don't want to do that. What would be the one thing I would tell you to do and starting where you are, which is certainly um, what's uh, one of my call of mentors, Dr. Westman would say, you know, start with people where they are. Okay. You need to drop your carbs. You'll, Ideally, drop it below 20 carbs per day. So you're going to need to know what 20 carbs per day looks like. So in that case, it still implies degree of food measuring, even if we're just talking about carbs and nothing else. If you can manage to drop your carbs to 20 carbs a day, let's start there. But I I feel it's a little bit, if you just, if that's the only thing you do, I can't see where you're going to get great improvement. I like the empirical. Maybe that's just me as a personality. Putting numbers to a situation allows us to box in certain variables and to be able to talk about what's working for you or not working for you, okay? Maybe you've heard that before, maybe not. That's just my sort of basic approach, the whole thing. Okay, Um, I wanted to say, why, because I'm looking at some of these questions, they're coming in before you get rolling. You know, why is it that I like C8 Keto MCT oil? or more specifically, uh, caprylic acid triglyceride, because it is the most efficient fat that you can find on the face of this planet at this particular moment that is natural. I mean, it's already made in the world. And caprylic, by the way, the root word comes from goat. You can even find it in goat milk, but it's not a lot. So I use this as my backup. My, you know, I I pour it on my meat for the night, you know, the fish or the chicken, whatever. Actually, I pour out a little um, C8 with vinegar. So I have, a, in essence, a salad dressing that I put on my my meat. So that automatically adds that fat degree and that ketogenic degree. So it's that's why I like it. It's tasteless. It's all the good things. Uh, so it's my backup. It's also, you know, people have asked a number of times, it's like, well, what do you do when you travel? Well, we just did travel. We had to, uh, we're here on Cape Cod right now. That's where I'm speaking from. We had to travel down to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, it's a fascinating part of the world. If you're from the Northeast and you go to the Deep South, and I guess that's not quite the Deep South, but getting pretty close. We know where Chattanooga is, right on top of um, Alabama for the most part, Georgia, Alabama. And um, uh, an entirely different history. You get to know about the Civil War, Um and I want to know more about Civil War. So what did we do? I, we had a travel thermos, a small travel thermos we put in the back. And so in that, besides the fake ice to keep it cool, we had our leftover meats we had in there. We had some uh, salami. We had a lot of hard-boiled eggs that we obviously hard-boiled before we left. And basically we had our small shaker of salt, a bag of salt. We had our C8, of course. We even had an eyedropper of C8. So if we're out and about, Judy could put it in her purse, and we did end up taking a tour of the uh, Biltmore Estates, and you get a coffee. You can add in the, the C8, and we added in some extra thick cream there too, and that would that made our coffee on the go, ketogenic, and it uh, hit us for the day. It was great. But having a travel, our travel bag is the salt, the C8, and for me, the stevia. Judy doesn't use any sweetener. And then we had our cooler. So we were good to go. So 
how I look at that, and part of that is simply straight off naturopathic, it kept us from having crap. You know, all these other, and we still slipped into a little crap, for lack of a better word. We had some fake cheese, not fake cheese, real cheese that were cooked into these crunchy things. And of course you go for them and I can't tolerate dairy. And certainly I had some and I had my dairy problems, but Judy found that was fine. So it works for her. So not everybody's the same. So I really don't have no interest in doing dairy and I slip into it every so often. Okay. So that's the travel kit people ask a lot about. So now back to the topic of, we're just talking about dairy. Why am I doing dairy again? We're not going to do, we're not going to do raw until next week. And I'm going to do raw plus the other alternative forms of dairy, such as the camel, the yak, the reindeer, the goat, the sheep, etc., and, and why they're different and why you may consider them. It's all interesting, by the way. And there's a big search of breaking away from cow dairy products in Europe and looking for other sources. And they're doing that. So we'll catch you up then. So I should plug in one last question. People are saying, so what changes have you made since you started keto four plus years ago? You know, you do a lot of self-experimentation, you know, well beyond the tracking that I described earlier. One of the changes we've done, we've moved pretty close to being zero carb all the time. What does zero carb mean? It means no veggies. Can you imagine that? A guy who had, you know, five years ago, we had huge vegetable gardens. We canned things. We I did a lot of that. In fact, we still have a lot of our canned things we did from the garden. We're not, it's not out of discipline. In one way, it's very convenient, but we feel very good about it. I find that I'm actually consuming fewer calories in the course of the day. But anyway, that's where our move is, is more towards a zero carb. I'm not trying to prove anybody's point. I'm not necessarily trying to move away from veggies, but it's just where we are. This is our experimentation right now, and it feels pretty good. I don't have any problems with that. We're selective about the meats we use, and uh, we can get in that for another topic. But that's one of the changes that we've been doing that people have asked. You know, as we all know, nothing stays in the same place. You're either refining it or you're quitting it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So back to combo products. You know, if I was to sum up, what are the most problematic parts about eating dairy, consuming dairy, and whatever form of dairy you're having? from milk to ice cream to cheese and all the various kinds of cheeses. And we'll talk more about the raw cheeses next week. But it comes down to casomorphines, IGF, insulin-like growth factor, one, estrogen, recombinant bovine growth hormone. And those are the top four. And I'm going to address those, and I know I talked about them a little bit last week, but if you get nothing about, you know, we're not even talking about a pastured cow versus a non-pastured cow. I'm going to assume the perfect cow, the perfect cow in the perfect pasture to have the perfect life, and it's giving you the best milk possible uh, on that kind of farm. And we're going to assume that it's an actual commercial cow though, okay? So I'm not going to get into antibiotics. I'm not going to get into that until later. And uh, those are harder to track down with dairy animals, by the way. So casomorphines, it's really an issue about human milk initially. So the constituents, the basic constituents of human milk, are obviously are protein, fat, and sugar, lactose, which is glucose and galactose. Galactose gets broken down to glucose, but it has to go through the liver first. So on the protein part, in human milk, the protein is 80% whey and 20% casein. They're both proteins. One kind of is a quick into your bloodstream and the other is a slower into your bloodstream. Weightlifters know all about that, but the point here is that human breast milk is primarily the protein, primarily whey. There's a lot of good aspects about whey. And the minor part, the 20%, is casein. So from that casein, when casein gets ingested by the baby, really by anybody that has a, a mammalian stomach, it will break down, digest, it will break down that casein. And one of its breakdown products, in essence, are a thing called casomorphine. So you have this big protein that gets digested, proteins get broken down into amino acids. And if there are more than one protein, it's called peptides. And then you have 
longer strings and shorter strings. So in essence, the first thing that happens when the milk, the casein comes into your stomach, human stomach, is that it breaks off a branch in essence. It breaks off a branch with about seven amino acids, what they call a bioactive peptide. Is that sounds pretty sophisticated, isn't it? It just means that it's actually will interact with your body on many levels and peptide simply means a string of amino acids. So you have this bioactive peptide that it happens with all caseins and the caseins are actually numbered, you know, so they have a whole category of caseins, these things that break off. And so the human casein is called, and they're all called beta casomorphine. So it's BCM. So the human, and then they have a hyphen after that, is it? And they give it a number from one to eight, I believe. So the human beta casomorphine, the function of that, as I mentioned a little bit before, it enhances the mother-child bonding. It makes the child want to come back for that drug, if you will. I mean, it's among all the other things, I'm sure it comes back for nutrition and so on and so forth, but that calmness that you see with success, successful breastfeeding is in part due to the morphine, the opiate. And you can call them opiates. In 1981, that's when it was first defined and discovered. And the research has gone nuts after that. But they actually call it morphine in milk and morphine in breast milk, of course. And so they Im- impose the meaning that, you know, this is the effect for sure. And maybe that's why it is. It enhances that, makes the child want to come back to to eat more, it needs to eat more because there's a lot of growth, especially in those first few months, if not first few years, to get going and has a lot of good things in breast milk. So that's the point. It's mother-child bonding. Now let's switch to cow's milk. Well, cow's milk, the protein in cow's milk, just the protein portion is just the opposite. It's 80% casein and 20% whey. So I'm going to give you two variables. One is that just on the amount of casein from cow's milk to human milk, it's four times more. Okay, it was 20% casein before. Now it's 80% in cow's milk. It's four times more. Well, that little chunk of bioactive peptides that is broken off when it starts to get digested in your stomach is a different type of beta casomorphine BCM. It's a BCM-7, and actually it's very potent. And there's a further elaboration we're going to go on. So BCM-7 is very potent. They argue that it's well over four times or more potent uh, casomorphine than human casomorphine. So just on that, if there was the same amount of casomorphine given to from cow's milk to human's milk, the one you got from cow's milk was four times more opioid-like, four times more drug-like. So now we have four times more casein, and we also have the ratio is also, it's about four times more effective. So you have a casein, a casomorphine that comes from a cow that is about 16 times more potent collectively than you get from breast milk. So that's one thing. So we have a history. All humans have a history, assuming they did some breastfeeding at some point in their life, of being exposed to casomorphines that opiate. It's just a lot stronger from cow's milk. That's the first thing. And now you have a cow is not a cow is not a cow. There's different types of cows and they actually make different types of beta casomorphine, BCMs. This is interesting. And now they break down all cows into kind of two categories. Uh, cows that create a A1 or an A2 casomorphine, right? So you have So the A1, so the ones that make that potent casomorphine I just told you about, the BCM7, the potent one. And the A2 do make another casomorphine, but it's actually very light. It's it's almost non-influential at all. So it's a huge difference. And so what do you find? uh, This is actually a big, big deal, and it's it's a big market changer. And so they're they're now this this has been researched over the last 20 years. And I might have mentioned uh, the book last year, the, the Devils in the Milk, came out in 2009. But they are now trying to, you know, grow their herds so that these, you have herds that are completely A2. I don't think there's a big market for A1, but this is what most of the milk out there is. The advantage of the A1 producing cows is that they actually produce more milk. 
So in terms of volume of milk, which is really what people are paid for, what farmers are paid for is volume of milk, that the general consensus prior to this differentiation between caseins is you know, get as much milk out there as you possibly could. So A1s produce more, A2 produce less, not a whole lot less, but less. A2s are, are primarily uh, Jersey's and Guernsey's, should you know what they are. Think of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, the black and white cow, for instance. And the other one was kind of the brown cow. And even that, it's a little bit too a black and white of an issue. You know, if you take a Guernsey and Jersey, they have mostly an A2 beta casein. So in other words, you can't, if you were a farmer and saying, well, I'm just going to go out and buy all the cows that are A2, well, what you'd be doing is you're buying, you're going to be buying cows that are mostly A2. They're all going to be, most of them are going to be, I shouldn't say all, most of them are going to be producing a little A1. So the time part is they're now having to breed the next, or the what used to be probably a thousand years ago, cows that are homozygous on both chromosomes, on both alleles that have the genes for A2. So they're homozygous A2. They're not an A2 and A1. Hope that's not too complicated, but basically it's all about the casomorphines. I mean, this whole thing's been working backwards. If the casomorphines from dairy were not such a big deal, did not make so many problems for so many people, this wouldn't be an issue. They'd say, well, who cares? Well, actually it's a big issue to the point that all those problems in humans, which are now like surfacing because they can be disclosed now and therefore the answer is go to A2 and get your herds A2 as as fast as possible, 100% homozygous. And there are some herds in the United States that are working in this direction too. If you go online and look for A2, A2 Milk is now a name of a company, but if you look for A2 Milk in the United States, you'll find there are some farms. If you call them like I did, you'll find, say, well, we don't have 100% right now, but this we're working to you. And it's a 10 or 20 year process to get their herds changed over that quickly. So what are some of these problems with that casomorphine? So the, the problems of those casomorphines is that it's associated in children. Let me bring it back to clinical practice, That uh, speaking of children. All, all children, and so I'm going to save autism and autistic spectrum for a second, and just talk about kids that were not so diagnosed. They would come in, and usually the number one diagnosis that was associated with dairy is it came through our office was earaches, ear infections. And then sinusitis. Adults had a lot of sinusitis as well. So that by itself was pretty easy to treat. You simply take away the dairy. But the problem is if they had had, you know, this for a number of years, that means that they probably would have been given a number of courses of antibiotics, which means that their gut microbiome has been disturbed consistently again and again and again. And sometimes with multiple different antibiotics, which is a, a very bad thing. So what you were left with was, of course, you got them off of dairy and you tried to find, you know, this alternative. And the problem for the parents were, now remember, I, I, I told you about this is an opiate. So there is, there is an addictive quality and that was purposely in the human milk. Remember, they was the child-mother bonding, but this addictive quality is a lot stronger with cow's milk to the point that University of Michigan and Yale both separately have endorsed cheese, pizza specifically, but cheese slash pizza as the most addicting food in North America. Isn't that interesting? So back for the child, so it's very easy for the doctor to say, hey, no milk, get that out of the way, we're moving on, you'll find some improvement. Well, suddenly the child's going to have withdrawal syndromes. It's it's not a joke. It's a it, it, it's It's going to be hard. They're going to want to have this. What can you replace this with? So we'd have to work at least a month on how are we going to do this so that we can pull away all the dairy products that they were using. Well, the upshot was, you know, once you got the dairy out of the system, it was a dramatic improvement. You know, hallelujah, everybody was on the same page and it was worth all the work, but it's a lot of work to get there because you're dealing with a drug. And and then you'd have to deal with how you can improve their uh, microbiome. Certainly that's probiotics, but it's looking at a number of other things as well. So the point was, because of the dairy, you had the otitis media, which are the ear problems, you had the sinusitis, you had the subsequent courses of antibiotics, and now you had a much bigger problem. All right. Now, when you're dealing with autistic children, it's even worse. And neonates, that is newborn uh, children, 
is that dairy is associated with what they call crib death. They basically fall asleep, think drugged, fall asleep, and you know are more unresponsive than they should be. And so that's one of the things. In terms of adults, uh, dairy is associated with type 1 diabetes. We're going to get into it, various uh, cancers, schizophrenia, dysthymia, which is depression. So it's not by its, even arthritis, it's not by itself. It's not just children we're talking about. So across the board, there is reasons to make this withdrawal, to take this out of your diet. And you will suffer those withdrawal effects. Believe me, you will. So the question is, how can you replace that? Uh, it's not always a question of just doing cold turkey, as they say, and just sweating it out. That's part of it. But it's good to put something in place that will replace your, not the cravings, but something that that habit that you had, that, that kind of food thing that you had. It's difficult. It's a big deal. The other thing that comes in the case of morphines is it's what they call a histamine releaser. So what is a histamine releaser? Every time you get congested, whether it's a cold or an, think of an allergy, and we know that uh, dairy in general is is uh, very common. It's, I think, the most common allergy to have, if not very close, one of the most common. And so you get the congestion, the mucus-producing membranes, the nose, the throat, the lungs, etc. So all these things are about dairy. You remove them, things get better. It's a big deal. So the trick was, and you had to brace everybody, was to, what are you going to do when you reintroduce it? Well, guess what? You've taken it away for six weeks to two months, and now you're going to reintroduce that cheese, that ice cream, that milk, that sour cream, that yogurt that they had before, you're going to have a much bigger reaction than you had before. So good news is it'll be very conspicuous that dairy was the issue. But the bad news is, you know, you don't want to hurt people unintentionally. So you really pare down the dose. You know, you don't give them a whole bowl of ice cream again. All right. So that was the case of morphine. And it's associated with a lot of different things. And in autism, you would get them off of dairy and you get them off of wheat. It was just a non-starter. It wasn't up to a just, it wasn't like, well, maybe do it. You had to do it. And uh, it did make a big difference. So it wasn't a cure-all. There are so many different causes for autism. It's a mixed bag. But across the board, you definitely could see there was a change. So FYI on that one. Well, the other thing that I really think you ought to just remember, and I did hit on it a little bit last week, is this thing called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. So the insulin-like growth factor, it's a, it's a, call it a growth hormone of a sort, it's basically something that should be in milk, should be in breast milk, should be in cow's milk, because it's being given to a, a newborn animal, a newborn mammal, and it's in basically all mammal milk. But it happens to be the identical molecule for cows as it is humans. It's one of these growth factors that obviously is about cellular growth. It tends to be associated with various cancers. Nobody's quite sure why, other than uh, cancers have unrestrained growth. I, I think some of you might know that. And so it supports that, which is not necessarily a good thing. And uh, obviously it's a good thing if you're in a young animal that needs to grow, of course you're gonna be about growth. But in an animal that doesn't need to grow, it's not necessarily a good thing. It also tends to shut down or dramatically decrease a process called apoptosis, which is what they call cell death. So as cells become old, senescence, as they say, is that they tend to die. Well, part of cancer cells, they kind of go on and on and on. They don't, they don't have that off switch. And one of the reasons they don't have that off switch, it's, this is the definition of cancer, is that it, it doesn't have a death a se on a cellular basis, is IGF-1. And so as a separate component to cancer, if you just go IGF-1 and cancer in humans, what you're going to find is associated with breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung and colon, and for pretty much the reasons I've told you about, and you can go in. So knowing that that association is very strong. Okay. So now what's the big deal about it's in the cow? and you drink the cow milk, and now it's in you, it actually doesn't quite work that that straightforward. Part of the argument is, oh, wait a minute, it's pasteurized, and the pasteurized kills all the IGF-1, so that's a non-starter of an argument. Well, pasteurization does not kill or alter the IGF-1. There is viable IGF-1. But what they do know is that dairy, collectively, it has other bioactive peptides in it, not just IGF-1, and they, they haven't pointed to any particular one because there's a lot of different things in milk. But collectively, 
there has been studies that show that yes, dairy drinkers have higher IGF-1 in their system, in you know, in their blood, and that is associated with various cancers, as I just mentioned. So there's a positive, positive. What's driving it? It's too easy to say that the cow IGF-1 drives the human IGF-1. It's probably clearly a contributing factor. Uh, what it tends to do is that when you digest it, when you're drinking milk, it tends, they think, passes out of, passes through your intestinal wall into your bloodstream and goes to your liver and your liver actually gets gets a bump up. It doesn't just get what it received, but it also then starts to, it gets a, it's a positive forward. So it's a multiplying effect. So know that IGF-1 cancer, because that has come, come up a couple times in our Facebook group, and I thought it was a great question. And you have to go through the steps to make that connection. You can't just say people who drink milk get cancer. They say, no, it's about IGF-1. And this has been found to be in higher incidence with these various cancers. Okay, after that, it's estrogen. Well, let's talk about the obvious. And, and you know, you're dealing with a female mammal that is about to give birth, either pregnant or did give birth. And estrogen is pretty high for those particular reasons. Well, the second question would be, um, and estradiol, which you have three different estrogens, estradiol is the one we're talking about. Well, the second question would be, oh, come on, is a bovine estradiol the same as a human estradiol? They're close enough, but the fact is that it is high and its amount varies. So the argument is some people say they're unrelated. That's very questionable. People feel they're quite related. They're not exact. And the other thing was, oh, well, of course, it's they're altered, they're denatured through the pasteurization process. That's not entirely true. And here's another factor. In the last 10 or 15 years, the practice of milking cows that are pregnant, not just milking cows that just recently gave birth, that have just calved. So when you milk cows during their pregnancy, the estrogen in the milk that has been milked from those pregnant cows is 30 times higher than the milk from the cow's that just gave birth. So estrogen is a factor in there. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist. And things that are estrogenic, we've heard a lot about xenoestrogens and you have synthetic estrogens. Well, estradiol, bovine estradiol is much more potent than all of those, all of those other estrogens. And they are problematic for a number of things. They're also a kind of growth hormone. That's why estrogen's there. So last we come to recombinant bovine growth hormone. I mentioned that not all farms use this, and it is a a GMO, technically. So it's a a genetically engineered molecule. And anywhere between 22 and 14% of the farms in the United States, from what my reading was, and I don't know if that's correct, you know, you could read yourself until you're dizzy. Just because it's in a study doesn't mean it's true. You look for a consensus, and you have to look for how the study was done, and then you look for who funded the study, et cetera, et cetera. So... So the recombinant bovine growth hormone is clearly into the, it's, it's a growth hormone that helps things grow. You know, it, and the reason that farmers give it for obvious reasons, it makes more milk, makes these cows make more milk. Making more milk is the business machine. So anything that drives more milk, I mentioned A1 cows, they make more milk. Unfortunately, the A1 casein is a big problem, but the intention is more milk, recombinant bovine growth hormone makes more milk. So that's why that's given. It's completely outlawed, by the way, throughout all of Europe. There is no recombinant bovine growth hormone. So it's not a little issue and maybe it will disappear in time. You know, it will be, maybe it will be outlawed in the United States, but United States politics are different and the dairy lobby is huge, has a lot of money. If you have a lot of money, you have a strong lobby, things don't get uh, dismissed that easily. Okay. I think I covered all the important things. So those are the things that you can take away and saying, these are the issues with dairy that I can reasonably say, I should think about this. And there's a lot of correlate. There's a lot of associations. You can go into PubMed you can go into Google Scholar. You punch in some of these and you'll see plenty of studies or meta studies or review studies. Uh, certainly you'll see a lot of blogs on them. I wouldn't trust the blog so much because, and this is really a pretty good point you'll find that most of the anti-dairy blogs are usually pro-vegetarian or or uh, pro-vegan, I should say. And so there's an agenda there. And so part of when you're looking at your sources of information, if you can spot the 
dominant agenda of that particular you know, writer and what they're hooked into. Sometimes it's not that obvious, but if there's a dominant agenda, so they're eager to get into saying why, how terrible dairy is because their conclusion is, well, therefore you should eat plants. I'm saying dairy has a lot of problems. And my conclusion isn't that you have to go eat plants. I'm saying, look at the problem. Let's have it be its own entity, its own topic and look at it for those reasons. And personally, who doesn't love cheese? Who doesn't love ice cream? I haven't had a glass of milk for, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, a long time ago. My wife says I drank milk when we, when she first knew me. I don't even remember that. It seems like an odd thing to be doing as an adult, frankly. <laughs> that's how I see it now. I go, oh, you're an adult and you drink milk? Really? Of course, that's just the corner of the world that I'm in, uh, which seems to be a minority. So the other topics that people hear about in terms of dairy is, and these are less, not less important. These are topics that are less written about, less harder to prove because there's not studies on this. There's basically associations been brought up. And so they go like this. MAP, M-A-P, three capital letters. It's a mycoplasm. Mycoplasm, same mycoplasm that causes tuberculosis. There's an association with MAP. It's an acronym for that particular kind of mycoplasm. So MAP has been found in dairy. And MAP, they believe, they believe, meaning certain studies show there's a correlation with humans that have Crohn's disease, that drank cow's milk. There's also a disease in cows that is very similar to Crohn's disease that has a higher percentage of MAP. So the association was, well, well, isn't MAP, this uh, mycoplasm, isn't that destroyed through pasteurization? It's dramatically reduced. They say it's reduced down to 1% to 3%, but there's some that is still there. So given the fact that there are plenty of people that have Crohn's in the world, and supposedly there's no cure to that. By the way, I had Crohn's and I had uh, ulcerated colitis, and that's gone. A whole other story, we'll get to it later. It wasn't a milk drinker. I might have been a cheese eater up to five or six years ago. But I would, I'm a little more sensitive about receiving that kind of information of MAP in cow's milk associated with Crohn's disease. I'd say that seems pretty viable. However, when you dig into it, there's just not a lot of paperwork on it right now. I'm not saying that it's not true. A man from, a doctor from London is all over this. And it's one of the things that the vegans point out as one more blow to dairy. I'm saying it's interesting topic and worth looking into, but there's just not a lot of information on it to hang your hat on yet. The other would be dioxins. Dioxins are a family of toxins, um, created toxins. They come out of uh, your PVC pipes and so on. And and they also, uh, dioxins, a certain kind of dioxin was part of what they call Agent Orange in, uh, in Vietnam which caused a lot of infertility when it was spread, used as a defoliant, caused a lot of infertility and a lot of uh, neurologic disorders on the surviving soldiers that came back from that time. Well, how does that tie in with dairy? Well, interesting, in the world of what they call environmental medicine, environmental medicine is looking at environmental causes of a particular disorder, a disease. And what they find is in locally made butter, so if you're in Netherlands, apparently was the one that was used as an example, but I'm sure you could use France or Germany or any place that had locally made butter that the cows were out on the pasture. You would buy the locally made butter and you would analyze it for dioxins and you would basically get a, a geographic reading of where the highest dioxin concentrations were by, you know, it probably fell on the grass and it was eaten by the dairy, but they would use butter as the measurement. So regional butter and they'd put that together. It was a, it was a butter map of dioxins throughout Europe. So there that's known. And I've known that for, oh, since early 2000. And what are you going to do about it? Well, you're not going to do much about it, but I'm just saying it's one more thing that is in, that's known that it's in milk, but it varies. So are you going to know if your butter has dioxins or not? That information is just not available. But it's always hard to go into the area of environmental medicine because you lead to the inevitable conclusion, the world's polluted and everything's bad and nothing's good to eat. So forget about it. <laughs> I didn't want to go so far. 
Uh, but that was interesting. The butter itself was the thing that they used to give them a local measurement of dioxins in the world, in Europe in particular. The question that comes up often is about antibiotics. Antibiotics is usually an issue that can be talked about with a higher degree of support with beef cattle, not so much dairy cattle. Obviously, there's a lot of antibiotics that are used for cows for helping them be, quote unquote, at least without the appearance of diseases, their mastitis and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it is used and they are used and the milk is tracked for some of the antibiotics. The argument goes this way, is that they, the antibiotics that they test the milk for are not the complete list of antibiotics they actually used on cattle, I'm sorry, on dairy. And I would buy that because they can't track every farm and so on and so forth. So it's always questionable. 80% of the antibiotics in the United States are used on large animals, are used in animal husbandry. And primarily that's beef, it's cattle, dairy and cattle. And primarily what they use them for was to beef them up, no pun intended, to make them bigger. And so they actually had the net effect of making these animals grow bigger. And so especially in terms of beef, you wanted big, heavy cows because you were paid by weight, the weight on the hoof. And so that is why, you know, there wasn't, they weren't disease oriented. They found this, this ongoing mix of antibiotics and probably have it down to a special recipe, really promoted growth and promoted, um, you know, more meat, more weight. So that was a good thing. Now they're having to rethink that for all the reasons because antibiotic resistance is shown to come from or to be one of the one of the origins is to come from uh, beef and I don't know about dairy. So I'm saying it's related. I personally don't know and I haven't found studies to declare that, but I feel that it's somewhat reasonable. Um, the last is radioactivity. Uh, we talk about Fukushima. We talk about strontium-90 back in the 60s. Those are all true. They are just, uh, one is there's not much you can do about it, but the bigger question is, is it even monitored? When it comes into the things that they eat, uh, it is ingested. And uh, one of the things about the uh, radiation is this strontium, strontium-90. It's very much like calcium, so it tends to uh, get into the calcium in the milk that we drink or the cows drink and into their bones. So these are the more environmental issues that are associated with dairy. I don't mean to be slamming dairy all along. I don't do dairy primarily because it's uncomfortable for me and it's pretty black or white. I, I like the idea of, you know, I, I eat meat, so why would dairy be any different? Well, this has made me collectively that first list of things of the of the case of morphines, the IGF and the estrogens. Those would be the ones that I would be focusing on. The subsequent ones, interesting issues. There's not a lot behind it to sort of say, hey, that's it. I'm never doing dairy again. So in the real world, what am I suggesting that you do? I'm suggesting that you cut down and play it by ear. Um, now you have some information you didn't have before that I think is actually very important. When I bring this back into the ketogenicity of Dairy, you know, well, wait a minute. Dairy, I just think if you're hearing that dairy is the perfect keto food, then you're talking to a perfect keto moron. Absolutely strong words. I'm sorry, strong words. But, you know, there was a conference we went to last year. We'll probably go again to this year because it's in the, it's in New England. I won't single it out. And they said, you know, come on in. We're going to be having, you know, grilled cheese sandwiches and cheese this and wine and cheese and so on and so forth. And it, it was actually predominantly going to be a, <laughs> a cheese day for their food while lectures are going on. I'm thinking, I understand how that's convenient and I understand how everybody loves it, but there's not a lot of thinking behind that. I think this is kind of that separation between at some point you have to think about food quality. You don't just look at the world like macros. These are the percent of uh, proteins that I should have, or these are the grams per protein on my kilogram per body weight that I should have, and this is the, the grams of carbs that I should have, and the rest is fat. I think at some point, you have to look at food quality. You don't have to be paranoid about it, but this is one of the issues that rises up and saying, you know, if you could do without cow milk and look for other products, and we're going to go into the raw aspect, and we're going to go into other uh, dairy products next week, and you'll see some benefits there. But 
I think burying your head in the sand on this one is really not a, a great option. There's other things to do. So with that, I'm going to end and then again, again, close with, by all means, keep sending some questions to Dr. Goldcamp and ketonaturopath.com. Uh, feel free to join our Facebook group at the same name, a keto naturopath. And I will be culling together all my notes on dairy and making a, a blog post about it. I don't mean to be making it into a dissertation, but I just wanted to go a little deeper on dairy than I had earlier. So all the best. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy week after week.